when you're on that roller coaster ride going down, people are like, well, you didn't hold on to your like drink. You're like, I was, you know, going <laughs> vertical down. You know, I'm sorry. Things were falling out of my pockets. I wasn't prepared to be going down. Growth is oxygen for startups. Sooner or later, you'll want to do Google Ads, Instagram, Display, TikTok, SEO, what have you, News Flash. You will not do these well on your own. That's where Insil comes in. There are a lot of agencies out there, but not many of them are rated 4.8 stars on Google. Do growth right. Go to insil.com.au to get in touch and tell them we sent you. We know how hard it is to find and afford the A players who will help your startup succeed. But don't despair. Instead, talk to our friend of the pod, Until Now. Until Now gives you access to top-tier fractional experts, so you don't have to settle. I've worked with these folks at Airtasker, and they're behind the rebrand of this very podcast. They are the real deal. Check out their work and get in touch at untilnow.com.au. You're listening to The Startup Podcast. This is a Reacts episode. Industry insiders having frank debates about the latest tech, politics, and business news. Whether you're a founder, investor, or operator in a startup, you'll gain insights into how current events connect to broader themes and trends that impact your startup, your investments, and your day-to-day operational decisions. The conversation starts now. Hey, I'm Chris. And I'm Yanib. And I'm Emil. In today's episode, we are going to follow up on the drama of OpenAI. Since the last episode, a lot of things have played out. Sam is back. Let's unpack it. So guys, Sam Altman is back at OpenAI. Who would have thought that such an eventuality would occur? Well, actually, in our back channels, we were saying that's a likely outcome. But look, the board went back and forth. There was a announcement that Sam and Greg and a big chunk of OpenAI was moving over to Microsoft. The OpenAI team, of course, were really upset about that. I think some 400, then 500, then 600 employees signed a letter saying, we're following them to Microsoft unless this board resigns and Sam comes back. So anyway, long story short, Sam and Greg and the whole team are back and in situation at OpenAI. I mean, I thought it was inevitable because there was no smoking gun, right? Remember when this first happened, everyone's instincts are like something bad must have happened. And as time went on, there was no personal incident or malfeasance. It was more of a generalized fear. And I don't know if you've read those quotes that the new CEO for a minute, I forget his name. Emmett Shear. Emmett Shear came in and said, I want to know what happened. And he couldn't get an answer. And he said, I'm going to quit if no one could give me an answer as to why this happened. So when you have this like generalized, you know, let's kick Sam out and nothing specific, of course, all these employees of this company that's worth $86 billion are going to say, what the heck? And it was natural that he'd come back, but what a soap opera. And the Ilya flip was something that I still don't understand. I don't know if any of you get that, but that was sort of a critical change. Yeah. Well, I mean, what seems to have happened, like during that hot moment when Sam and all the team was going to join Microsoft, what it looked like was that Microsoft had pulled off this incredible corporate bit of jujitsu where they had effectively acquired OpenAI for zero dollars, right? For free. Because if you understand the deal that OpenAI had with Microsoft, they already had all the IP and everything like that. So They had the IP, OpenAI is already running on their servers. Now they have all the people. Well, apart from the brand, which actually is worth something, but still not that much, they had it all. And so I think maybe at a certain point you're like, oh, okay, I believe Ilya's, I don't know the guy, but it seems like his heart is pure, right? Like we talked about in the last episode, the fact that this is a not-for-profit, it has ideology behind it, it has a governing charter. And I believe that Ilya thought that Sam was not keeping to the spirit or not allowing the board to do its job, which is to make sure that whatever the open AI business was doing was in keeping with the charter of the not-for-profit. So he kicked him out. But then when he saw that basically what he had done is, what is that horrible quote from the Vietnam War? You know, we burned the village to save it. That's what had happened, right? Like he got nothing, no benefit to the not-for-profit from this, no benefit to AGI for all. If anything, he'd made that worse and he'd killed an $80 billion business that he loved and cared about and completely torched his own position in this world. It was obviously not the outcome that he would have wanted. And so he was, you know, I guess, humble enough to just wave the flag and say, you know, guys, I screwed up. 
Yeah, it's interesting how these narratives develop, right? Because I do think the takeaway now is Ilya's heart was pure or he was acting in what he thought was the best interest. But I think if he didn't revoke his position, he realized he had broken everything and that he was at risk of becoming Aaron Burr in the story, right? <laughs> he was like... He was Judas. And so maybe his heart is pure. Maybe he realized he was about to fuck the company and wanted to take it back. And maybe he didn't want to go down in history as killing one of the most important companies or the most important emerging companies in, in the history of the world. So who knows what his real heart of hearts is. But what struck me is that someone is lying. And still, to this day, someone is lying, right? Either the board is lying about Sam and just not being forthcoming about what happened. Or Sam and Greg are lying about the board and what they've been saying and not saying to the board, and they've been playing this Machiavellian game. But somebody is lying, and we still don't know who and why. Well, here's my theory. So I remember, Yanov, you were very, last time we spoke about this, you're like, the board did its duty. They had a nonprofit charter, and they were executing its duty. What came out after is, is one of the other board members was like, it's fine if open AI goes down the tube. If the result of doing that, destroying the body, the burning the village to save it, killing the patient, or trying to cure it, that notion was crazy to me that a board member thought that it was okay not to move the thing forward, but to kill the company. And maybe that's what turned Ilya. But I think the real problem here is Adam D'Angelo, CEO of Quora, who's been on the board. He talked the least. And my belief is that Ilya Turning gave him the majority he needed to push Sam out because he was leading the other two board members who were more academic and less focused on sort of the mixed business and academic reality that all of us have to live in. And once Ilya gave in, the last person that had to save face was Adam. And he's the only person that survived on the board. And this is the classic Chinese art of war. Give the guy an off-ramp and he got an off-ramp and he's the only board member that survived where the other two are like, fine, we're out of here. So anyway, that's my theory on that. Yeah, it's a shame that it was the two women that got ejected out the side. But we said this in the last episode, and I'm not hearing enough people talk about this always, which is that we have to keep remembering, keep remembering, OpenAI is not a traditional Silicon Valley company. And so their behavior is not rational in that context, or has not been rational in that context. It is a nonprofit that has a commercial entity attached. And so, you know, this idea that it's okay to kill the company because the nonprofit will survive or like, you know, it, our goals are more higher level or loftier than this. And we're not here to move fast and break things. It makes things a little clearer, a little bit more rational when you look at it that way. Not a lot more, but a little more rational that way. And in particular, in the context of maybe something happened that nobody wants to talk about in the form of a big breakthrough. You know, so the, one of the things that's been rumored around is this thing called Q-Star, which everybody's very excited about. And there's another idea out there floating around, which is that GPT-5 is a 100x larger model. It was part of the thing that lifted the veil, that pushed the frontier forward, that had Ilya spooked. Something in there, you know, GPT-5, Q-Star, something we don't know about maybe cooking up and nobody really wants to talk about it in the press. What do you guys think about that? So QSTAR was a research project by Ilya, who Ilya sort of had been working on for years. My understanding of it doesn't require all the data inputs that ChatGBT4 is. It can learn how to reason as it's going along. So the exa best example I got is like you're playing a video game and instead of absorbing all the history of moves on this video games, it can, without that, actually start to be smarter about what moves to make next. And that's the beginning of being able to do something that's close to human reasoning. And it could do basic math problems, which I guess is difficult to do when it's not based on sort of just the history of the internet saying one plus one equals two. That was one theory, this Q star sort of development and chat GPT-5. But here's the thing is, let's suppose those things were scary. Couldn't the board have said, you may not launch ChatGPT-5, which what boards do. They put guardrails, they set budgets, they say, this is not ready for release. Right. Traditional traditional boards populated by sophisticated board members do that, yes. <laughs> and I think the point is to disparage the board here. Again, I think it's a different situation. And I actually think that's the most plausible explanation for all this, because the board is saying, Sam wasn't being honest and transparent with the board. I think what they felt was that if they set guardrails, that Sam would not honor them, right? That Sam wanted to accelerate AGI and he thought he was in a good position to do it. And so I think he was probably keeping little secrets. Maybe he didn't tell the board about QSTAR. Maybe when they gave him instructions to not well, do Ilya, certain things, he did them anyway. But remember, Yanov, Ilya developed QSTAR. 
Yeah. Well, I reckon what they felt was that Sam was rogue. I have some sympathy for them. I think they acted foolishly, but not in an unsophisticated way. And also, I like the analogy of nuclear power because I think it makes it a bit clearer how they are thinking about this stuff, right? You have this technology that, rightly or wrongly, they believe has the power to do tremendous good and tremendous evil in the world. And the whole point of the not-for-profit is to make sure that it is channeled towards the good. And they see that they've got this like mad scientist at the helm. All he wants to do is make progress on nuclear stuff without thinking about the potential for abuse, without respecting the board's desire and the, the not-for-profit's charter to be very, very careful that nothing bad can come from this. And they're like, this guy, we can't control him. We need someone we can control so that we make sure that he doesn't blow up the world. You're just assuming a lot of background there. Sure. That they said, hey, please don't do this and other things. And he didn't do them and nothing like that's come out. But Adam D'Angelo at Cora did launch a competitive LLM called Poe. And mm. apparently he was upset on demo day or dev day for open AI that he wasn't given a heads up. It wasn't communicated to as what the board said in the way he wanted to be communicated to. So there's some self-interest there. You have another board member who is writing papers against open AI and promoting Anthropic's sort of superiority and you, that's a violation of your duty of loyalty even on a non-profit board she has some like real incompetence slash conflict of interest stuff there as another narrative to consider yeah look i think a few things there Elia invented Q star or Q learning or the Q thing, sure, but he may feel like in Sam's hands, that invention can be mishandled. So he could still have invented the scary thing while still being afraid of the person whose hands it'll be put in control of. In terms of the board, I think it's been the common narrative. I think it's easy to say they're incompetent and irrational and it doesn't make any sense. I think what Yanev said is the only narrative I've heard that makes it rational, which is we see this guy through some and not so subtle action being reckless and we ask him to do certain things and he is maybe doing a version of those things but not doing them well or not doing them earnestly and we can't quite put our finger on it but he's dangerous and we can't articulate it and so we've decided for the best interest of the non-profit higher level higher order bit mission he needs to go and we need someone who's a little bit more rational and that makes sense as a narrative, a lot more than everything else. I think, Emil, you're saying they may be conflicted. I'm saying they may be incompetent. <laughs> and Yanev, you're saying they may have had a good reason, they just can't articulate well. But irrespective of the reason, they executed it poorly. I think we agreed to them that last episode. That, yeah, I don't think we have to beat that horse. The execution was poor. We all agree on that. They should have killed him. <laughs> <laughs> the execution should have been more like at the back of the head. More literal, yes. But the other thing that is also certain is that the company, or let's say the entity of OpenAI, which is this complicated mess, got ahead of its skis, right? It started off as this research company with academics and altruistic people on the board with a non-profit entity, and it was structured in such a way and populated with such a group of people that it was not ready for ChatGPT to become this massive, fastest product growth in history, to suddenly become the most important partner for one of the most important tech companies in the world in the form of Microsoft. It just was not prepared for this. And again, not to keep beating this drum, but, you know, Emil, I think coming from Uber, we can relate a little bit to like, oh, we weren't prepared to be this important, this fast and have our dirty laundry gone through, right? It's easy to empathize with people who have had unexpected success and didn't have time to pause and build a HR department or build a thing or build a better board. And a lot of people outside the tent piss inside, you should have thought and you should have realized and you should have known. And it's like, dude, we're just trying to stay alive. <laughs> we're, just, we're just scrappy entrepreneurs here. And so I think that is something that people aren't talking enough about is they just kind of got caught flat footed in something that was way more successful, commercially successful than they expected, way faster than they expected. What do you guys think about that? I think there's something there that I agree with that like when you're on that roller coaster ride going down, people are like, well, you didn't hold on to your like drink. You're like, I was, you know, going vertical down, you know, I'm sorry. Things were falling out of my pockets. You know, I, I wasn't prepared to be going down. But also I think the other thing, and I mentioned this last time, but I've thought about it some more is the cost of compute on this thing kind of makes the nonprofit notion sort of impossible, right? You have to make enough revenue at least to cover the compute costs. 
And none of these, even Anthropic, which is structured in a similar way, I think they're going to face their day of reckoning too. It's like, how do you balance the need to actually pay for people to use this stuff, which you need them to use it to prove that it works and to figure out what guardrails put on it and all. Like usage gives you the opportunity to make it more safe. Non-usage doesn't. So if usage is expensive, then you have to have a business model behind it. And that's why I think, generally speaking, everyone who's set up this way in the AI space is going to have a challenge. And they just hit it first and fastest. Yeah, I, I just want to, because I think this is a recurring narrative in tech where some of these companies hit on something and it blows up. ChatGPT hit on something and their GPU costs blew up and their importance blew up. Facebook hit on something with the news feed and it has, of course, contributed, I'll say, to polarization and a weirdness happening in our dialogue. Uber hit on something and it had these real world implications. And you get these people, and I'm going to name one because I don't like her, Kara Swisher. And I you get these people great. who from the- I love Kara. Don't listen to Chris. <laughs> okay. You like her. I don't like her. You get these people who from the outside go, well, Zuckerberg should have known. He should have known that it would have caused all of this polarization, right? Like those Uber guys, they should have known that this thing could have happened in the real world, right? And it's like, yeah, Kara, if you're outside the tent and you are outside the arena- and you're watching it in 2020 hindsight, then you know, good on you, congratulations. But the people who are many of them very well-meaning, who are just trying to make their product useful, while others accuse them of making it addictive, right? And it's like what everybody in the world is trying to do is make their product useful, make it at scale, and have it make contact with the real world. And when a tech company does that too successfully, too quickly, I think it's just very easy to, from the outside, go, you should have known, you are reckless. And it's like, maybe. Or maybe we were just trying hard to make something valuable and it got away from us. Okay. Well, first of all, I love Kara Swisher. I'm, I'm very upset at you, Chris, because now she's never going to come on this show and she would be fantastic. She'll just make useless snide remarks anyway, like she does on mainstream TV. Nonsense. I completely agree with her, right? Like just because you may not have been able to foresee a consequence doesn't mean you shouldn't take some responsibility for it. It's like you're, you know, no, that's privatizing. You're saying, hold on. Are you saying you take responsibility for the externalities after you find the externalities? Or you should stop inventing before because there might be something that happens that you don't like in the future. Those are two very different things, Jonathan. Okay, I would say the former, take responsibility for the externalities when they start to happen. And I think one of the points that she makes, I don't want to speak for her, is that when the externalities emerge, there is a financial incentive to bury the problem and to deny it rather than to take it on, right? And I think Yeah, but I also true. disagree with that. I also disagree with that. I think that's a, that's a two-dimensional view of the world. As far as I could tell, as soon as Mark Zuckerberg realized those externalities, he judiciously started adding fact-checking and things, but didn't become the dictator and arbiter of what is truth. Right. I think as soon as, and again, I'm keep banging this drum, but as soon as, for example, sadly, a rape occurred in an Uber, th the message was not bury this. It was an Uber needs to become the safest bubble in the city. That was the reaction from Travis on stage. And so these companies, I think, are the narrative is they want to bury it. It's not in Mark Zuckerberg's interest to tarnish the reputation of Facebook. He well, wants let let, let me connect. give you an example. Let me give you an example. So children, right? In theory, Facebook and Instagram and all of those things have not been available to children. You have to be at least 14 or 18, whatever it is, to use those things. But in reality, it is trivial for a child to get an Instagram account. And if Facebook wanted to stop children getting on Facebook and was willing to invest resources into that, I have no doubt they would have solved that problem. But it was not in their interest because children are some of their best users and then they become adults who already have a habit. So I think there's absolutely a point here where when it goes against your commercial interests that you don't invest in the things that would make your product safer. I mean, come on, man. Like, where are the parents? Let's say there's a PG-13 movie showing on cable TV. What is the cable company supposed to do if your kid walks in the room? Like, Man, that's, like, know, that's what the cigarette companies used life. to say. That's what, you know, it's no, like, no, sure, no, no. sell cigarettes to everyone. Where are the parents? Why are you letting your kids light no, up? No, no. You know, come on. No, 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 <laughs> we don't. Yeah. Look, on, are, are there, I think there are definitely cases where there's the deliberate underinvestment in certain things, but I don't think these democracy breaking externalities are the intended consequences of a Facebook or what have you. These are things that happen at scale that are hard to anticipate and hard to solve and much, much harder to solve than anybody imagines. When people go, well, they shouldn't allow misinformation on the platform. Well, what the hell is misinformation? Good luck clarifying that.
Well, also, let me just say, and I'm glad that at least you said the externalities after is something I have to deal with, because what a lot of these journalists are saying is they're actually more extreme. They're saying, while you're building stuff, you have to sort of slow down your build because there might be stuff. And you're like, well, what stuff? And then you get into this crouch posture where you're sort of like a European economy that wants to pre-regulate everything. And look at all the companies that have come from the Silicon Valley. And I know people don't like to say move fast and break things, but we all know what Mark meant. He didn't mean to break the world. He meant like move fast. And if the code breaks and some feature doesn't work, like keep going. It was more innocuous than the world makes it seem. Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Airbnb, Uber, all within a 30 mile radius. Think about the market cap creation. That's right. When you have the opposite approach, right? Which is start building and then let's self-regulate down the line when we need to. So let's connect this back to lessons. We love to do that at the Startup Podcast, right? You and I have talked about this idea that many cultures, many, many cultures, especially outside of US, especially outside of Silicon Valley, have a real deferential relationship to authority and are either heavily regulated or heavily concerned with what leaders or cultural norms and dogma might say. And I think this is problematic when you are trying to build a Silicon Valley style startup. And one of the things that informs or is characteristic of a Silicon Valley style startup is you're allowed to break things. It's in the DNA of the culture that you break things, break norms, break dogma, break culture. And too many founders that I work with that ask me to help advise them are too afraid to break things. They have the opposite problem of Mark Zuckerberg or of Sam Altman. And that's something they need to watch out for. But again, look, I, I think I largely <laughs> agree with you guys. I guess it also depends on what the consequences are. And I mean, you know, you use the word externalities and that's exactly right. And like you said, move fast and break things doesn't mean move fast and break the world. And I think there have been times where Silicon Valley companies have been a bit too cavalier with their externalities. Just to bring this back to OpenAI and tie a nice bow around it. If you believe that the externality might include the end of human civilization, which is what the board thinks then you do need to be careful, right? And not just deal with it after the fact, I suppose, which is where you get to that point of like, okay, it's very hard to anticipate externalities. The only thing you can do is move more slowly. And that is not something that Sam Altman was prepared to do. But again, the move slowly thing assumes that with time, some genius is going to look and say, oh, that's going to be a problem. Who do you trust to do that? Like, who is the sensor who says AI shouldn't do this and they're going to find it because they're moving more slowly while China's racing ahead? It's worse than that. It's worse than that. It's not going to be one someone with some prophetic vision of the future who can tell you what's going to go wrong. The entire company and culture will not do things because there might be a consequence. Like we've all seen or lived in these companies where legal and compliance and HR and everybody says, oh, you can't do that because it might be a problem later which characterizes every big co in the history of the world. That's the defining anti-pattern of a startup is you can't have everybody frozen in place going, oh my God, what if we did this? And something unexpected occurs. It's like, yeah, that's the idea. Something unexpected is supposed to occur. Yeah, look, I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think in the case of AI, it's impossible, right? Here's the interesting thing. This is becoming intellectual, I guess, but um, <laughs> what we're actually saying, if we were to sort of abstract the framework, is that moving fast means that you are going to generate unintended externalities. Now, some of those externalities will be negative and a lot of them will be positive, right? You're making the world a better place, sometimes in ways you haven't expected. And in general, I agree with you that the trade-off of allowing companies to move fast and generate those externalities is a net positive. And definitely if you're a founder, you should be moving fast and trying to do this. But what if the magnitude of those externalities tends towards the infinite, which is what the open AI board believes? Yes. Then it breaks your mental model. And again, talking about Ilya's journey, and again, I don't know him, but my speculated journey for Ilya is he's like, oh, okay, doing this does not reduce the probability of a negative outcome for the world, right? It's like the genie's out of the bottle. But what the open AI board is trying to do is say, oh, okay, well, let's, let's keep this genie under some control. It's like, no, either it's our genie or it's someone else's genie, but it's out of the bottle. So just one clarification, just so I make sure. Let's say the risk is existential to mankind, and that was what their board was worried about. Well, then do they give that power? Do they cede the race to China? I agree with you. In that instance, and the end of the world's coming anyway. 
I didn't really think whether I was an accelerationist or a decelerationist until last episode, but I real I guess I am an accelerationist. And so I agree with you on that. The only hesitation I have is it can sound a bit like global warming or whatever. It's like, well, the world's going to end anyway, and we can't do anything about it from our little place. So might as well keep burning fossil fuel. There's like, we've got to try to do something about it, but who knows what. This episode of the Startup Podcast is brought to you by Until Now. From brand and product design to product management through to go to market and product strategy, Until Now lets you augment your existing team with the skills required to achieve the best outcomes for your startup. So check out their work and get in touch at untilnow.com.au. So, Chris, we have merch. We do, yes. I just hit publish on the store last night. I'm very excited about it. I think it looks fantastic. So, I've worked with you long enough, Chris, to know that you're absolutely anal about design. It drives me crazy. And so, this is a great combination of the beautiful logo type that was designed for us by Until Now and your work. These things look great. And just as importantly, folks, if you buy these items, you are supporting us on the Startup Podcast, and it means the world to us. Chris, I understand these are limited edition as well. Yeah, that's right. And these are the first drop from us. There are limited numbers. I've got edition one on there. And so people will know you are fully OG on the startup podcast. And they're also, you know, subtle, minimal, clean, elegant designs. They have just our mark, but not the words. Then maybe you can spot each other at a WeWork. That's right. You can give each other the secret TSP handshake. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've wanted to do this for a long time. So I'm really excited, folks. I urge you to check them out. They're really cool. And like I said, a great way for you to support us and what we do on the Startup Podcast. That's right. So visit shop.tsp.show and you'll find the products there. And you can buy them pretty much anywhere in the world. Not North Korea. I'd like to spend a little time talking about what was Microsoft's risk through this? What were the worst case scenarios that were going to occur? So I think Satya came out of this looking really great, right? He looks like an agile, thoughtful, fast moving, three-dimensional chess playing CEO at the helm of one of the largest and most important companies, right? But I think we have to realize two things. That was a bit of damage control, right? And it's great to be fast on your feet during damage control. And he was pulling a win out of a loss. That's great. But I think the other thing he needs to be acknowledged for is the deal was set up pretty well in the beginning. My understanding is it was going to be done through a series of tranches. So I don't think he put the money up front and a lot of it was in kind. So there was no actual cash at risk. And I think Emil, I don't know this for sure, but you were saying they have the IP as well. So that's a pretty amazing deal structure. Emil, maybe you can speak to that. And then the other thing was, yeah, that was a win, but like we have to recognize he exposed himself to massive platform risk to a degree, accounting for all those other deal terms. And he had to move fast. So yeah, it was a win for Microsoft, but he needed to do stuff. Otherwise, it could have quickly turned into a loss. Yeah, so let's be clear that I think Satya is proving to be one of the great CEOs of this generation. Truly, like taking Microsoft where he found it to where it is, and it's a badge of honor to work at that place. Now, where it was a badge of like working at Verizon, before you took over in terms of you being a creative engineer or product manager, they're doing some really great things. And I think it's largely due to his culture change, his sort of aggressive style, just everything about him. He's like proven to be quite talented, but yes, in this situation, he had a lot to lose. I don't know if he was playing four dimensional chess. There was these things about like, oh, he's going to buy open AI for free. And that was his idea all along. No, I don't think he was that. He invested a lot of time and money in this company. Google has DeepMind. This was his sort of outsourced AI play. And so, yes, it would have been risky for him to lose that in the long term. So he had to play defense, but he played it pretty, pretty masterfully. And I think probably got the outcome he wanted. I mean, think about this. He's got Sam back, but he's going to have a board now with stronger governance, with more experience that does actually act more professionally, which is good for his economic interests. If the world's going to end, if, you know, if, if there wasn't control there. So I feel like he came out a big winner here, but as a result of having a lot to lose, like you say, I, I agree with you on that, Chris. He moved really fast to make the deal with OpenAI before anybody else could. But I'm generally advising founders to be very careful about partnerships, certainly very careful about trying to get your technology solution from a non-platform company. So I see founders reach out to consumer companies or B2B companies and try to license some part of their tech. And I'm like, that's a fail. They're not going to invest in that partnership and you guys are going to have misaligned incentives. Where, of course, OpenAI is different is they were the leading provider are still the leading provider and they position themselves as a platform company so that's those two things are okay but yeah it goes to show you just how big a risk when you rely on a single vendor can be and this is maybe a segue to another topic we want to talk about 
And yeah, he was exposed to that risk by moving fast and making that decision to invest in them quickly and take them off the board for everybody else. And he cleaned it up really nicely. I think that's an example of moving fast, exposing yourself to a breakage, believing in yourself that you can handle any possible breakage and then handling the breakage. And that that's really what we talk about when we talk about moving fast and breaking things. It's not like breaking them and then leaving them broken on the floor. It's about believing you can clean up the mess and keep going. And that's the important thing there. Well, you said a stronger board and it sort of depends what you mean but i think it comes down now to having experience experience they're not going to make the rookie mistakes we're talking about the the competence level i'm not talking about the ideology i think that's the point though is is that what we're going to have now is an open ai with less shenanigans that runs more like a traditional capitalist company that can be relied on by people who rely on that sort of organization. And so, yeah, I I think it's, it's a big win for Microsoft. It's a big win for Sam Altman. And yeah, I guess depending on where you fall on the existential risk of AGI, (laughs) it means we're going to get more better products sooner. So that's kind of cool. Do you really think so? You think that they're necessarily going to be less worried about existential risk or they'll be better able to identify it? Well, put it this they're way. not an academic that's writing random papers. Sam had a lot of leverage. Sam Altman had a lot of leverage. He wasn't going to come back and then accept a board that was going to cramp his style. That is my belief. You know, he was going to go to Microsoft and get to do pretty much what he wanted. And to come back to OpenAI, he was going to be like, look, we're doing this my way now. <laughs> like, this is Steve Jobs coming. This is the Apple narrative compressed into a week. This is like, I heard that, you know, this is like the Apple narrative for the TikTok generation. He's come back. He is the all conquering savior. He gets to do it his way now. Yeah, I want to unpack the consequences in just a second, because I think there's a lot of consequences and what you're alluding to, Yanev, is one of them. Just the last point I want to make about Microsoft and Risk is I think Microsoft had a lot of cards to play and Satya was playing them very well. I think the entity that had or entities that had a lot less cards to play and were at larger risk were the VCs who invested in the for-profit entity. They almost had their ass handed to them. And if they didn't contribute to the staff rebellion and contribute to the narrative and contribute to pushing and prodding behind the scenes, I imagine, then they would have been in serious trouble with their LPs. They really could have fucked the whole thing up or or rather the whole thing could have been a big fuck up for them. And I think that there aren't enough people talking about the VC community and how at risk and exposed they were. Yeah. Why, well, you know, look, Vinod Kosla was tweeting a storm and they were all contributing to the social pressure, I think. Even Josh Kushner was tweeting, which is rare for him. Sequoia, like they were coming out of the woodwork to do what they could, but you're right. They were largely pretty powerless besides being influential. There was no board votes. They had no shareholder rights, none of the normal things, but they did have a lot to lose. But I also think someone like Vinod, who I know well enough, like actually believed Sam was right. It wasn't like the $50 million he invested through Coastal Ventures. Yeah, that mattered to him, but he really actually thought it was a bad outcome for the company. There's one name I want to mention for a future episode with you guys. There's a guy named John Tinter, who is Satya's right-hand deal guy, as I was to Travis. And he is Mm. really good. You know, I text him a few times during this thing, but he's been for years behind a lot of Satya's great moves. And so there are some good people at the top there. And they got back to your question you asked a, a few minutes ago. They did a really good deal. Initially, Microsoft did. Source code to everything OpenAI does up until AGI. Credits, you know, prepays, a lot of of good stuff and sophisticated deal making. But back to your point, I disagree with you on it. I think like Larry Summers, Brett Taylor, these are pretty respected people. Like, yeah, capitalists versus academics. I don't necessarily think they're going to be less capable at doing the safety stuff that needs to be done than Helen Toner or, or the other person. Yeah, look, I think the counter argument here is it's a quote or something, but it's like people whose incentive it is to look away are not going to take a look at the problem, right? And so Vinod, I'm sure he earnestly believes that Sam's the right guy. And, you know, I think many people believe Sam's the right guy. I'm probably one of them. But it's also in his best interest that Sam is the guy, sure. right? That there is an excellent commercial operator that he knows and likes running that thing. And I think that position is pretty rational for him. And I do agree with you, Yanev, related to this, which is one of the big takeaways here. And, and let's roll to takeaways and what happens next. One of the big takeaways is that the people who were ideologically concerned about safe AI lost. They lost. That's my point. There are now thoughtful, well-respected, but commercially focused people running the show. Brett Taylor, I've met Brett and I've observed him for a long time. He is a very thoughtful person and is a great technologist and a great product leader. He's a wonderful person to be at the charge of a company on a board, but he's not a decelerationist, I bet, and he's not a nonprofit guy. 
Sam's not a nonprofit guy and the nonprofit academics were ejected out the side, rightly or wrongly. And so I do think this increases the risk. But I also think it's probably marginal because the risk is all around. It's like there is a bunch of state and non-state actors that are going to be doing this whether OpenAI consents to it or not. And so this is just a big ball of risk. But it's certainly at OpenAI, they're going to move a little faster than they would have before. It's so good. I, I completely disagree with both of you on this. I'm like, Larry Summers was president of Harvard. He was treasury secretary. Job loss caused by AI. He's going to have to explain to Democrats in the Senate. As far as I know, he's not financially motivated to do this. He's not a CEO. He's never a CEO. You know, this person was an academic. And if you have better governance, I actually think you can have actually pretty resilient processes that are not random. Like, hey, stop G-Star. We don't like it. We're scared. As opposed to here's a methodology of which we're going to figure out when we were going too fast or too slow. And here's the decision-making criteria we're going to have to go through. That actually may end up being safer because it's more understandable, more done in a way that it goes through the right hoops. Look, I, I hope you're right. I don't think there's a fundamental disagreement here, but I guess what I come down to is like, I'm, I'm thinking of the game theory of this and the leverage that Sam Altman has, right? So this is a serious board. You're right. And Larry Summers is not, you know, these aren't a bunch of puppets. But I think what Sam has in his back pocket is, again, he has come back as the conquering hero, and he knows that if the board gets too far up in his grill, he can just take his whole team and move across to Microsoft. So the leverage situation between CEO and board has a lot of power vested in the CEO at this point. And so the board is going to have to be much more, at the very least, much more collaborative, right? Rather than just sort of saying, well, you're fired if you don't do it, what we tell you to do. So let's continue talking about the kind of what happens next. What are, what are the long-term implications of this? I think just to rattle some off here and you guys can pick up whatever thread you like, I think there's definitely going to be a heightened awareness of AI platform risk. And so many of the companies that are building applications on these models are going to want to diversify their vendors, which I think we keep relearning this lesson over and over and over again, whether it's Twitter developers or whatever, but your know, platform risk is real and you need a diversified set of vendors. You know, I think nonprofits certainly as a structure is not going to be something that people rush to go do anymore. I think founders, we talked about this in the last episode, founders are going to have more caution in constructing their boards and their rules. Everyone's got a lot more deeper respect, I think, for Satya. And of course, the other takeaway, I think, is that news outlets are going to be hiring more AI and confidence experts. I think those are the right takeaways. I've got so many calls from founders saying, hey, I'm looking at my board now. Like, what do I do? How do I think about this? How does this impact how I should think about it? And for the most part, the answer is not that much. <laughs> right? It's, you know, do you have dual class or not? And what does your document say about do you have board control already? And then, okay, fine. Based on what you have, here's what you might want to ask for in the future to have more control. And the one thing it has given me example to say is be wary of the resume of anyone you're putting on your board as the sole criteria versus are they in it with you? And by in it with you doesn't mean they have to agree with you, but it does mean, can they challenge you and can you challenge them? And are they going to add to your thinking or not? Someone who is like, oh, it's a Georgetown policy person and I'm putting them on there just because of their resume is likely to lead to disaster for everybody. So picking the person, I think, is back to like focus on who the person is as opposed to just their resume, I think is important for early stage founders. Yeah. So my thoughts are always, right, your board. I mean, we should do a whole episode on boards, not in the context of open AI, but just more generally. Boards are not important until they are, right? And so I think because of that dynamic, it can be really easy to get a board that looks good rather than a board that is good. And that is, yeah, I, I completely agree, Emil. It's a mistake. It's when the chips are down. It's when things are getting messy or difficult. That's when your board matters. And at that point, it's too late to do anything about who's on it. So don't go for right. credentials. Go for people who actually have the best interests of your company at heart and who are aligned with the major stakeholders, which is the investors and also the founders. Yeah, I, I do think we need to have a whole episode on boards. And I would take it further than you, Yanev. I mean, that's like poetically stated, but I think the board always matters. They are like an advisory board, which we have had a whole episode about, and like your investors and like your team and like your market, you need to choose it intentionally. And you want your board members, their network to help 
create a tailwind mm. for you. You want their insights to create a tailwind for you. There's a lot of founders outside of Silicon Valley who will just like, they'll add traditional business people to their board, real estate agents, and they're expecting them to help provide oversight for a Silicon Valley style disruptor. And as a CEO, you could spend, you know, minutes, hours, days, weeks trying to convince your board that you should be, you know, focused on growth instead of revenue or focused on B2C instead of B2B. And it is a massive distraction, massive distraction. And so many founders I work with, they're like, well, I need to take this to the board. I'm like, well, who's on your board? And they, they're rattling off like these traditional business people who have no fucking clue. And why are they making leadership decisions and governor decisions on the company? It doesn't make any sense. That's just worth a whole nother episode. And then yeah. I can go deep on the Uber board, which is like, you know, the prototypical example of a board gone wrong. And then you guys could argue with me about why I'm wrong about that being some of the worst decisions we ever made at the company. That sounds like Yeah, I, I'll throw another name under the bus that others might be afraid of doing, Emil. All right, guys, this has been another fun episode. Our first two React episodes have been about OpenAI, but over time, we're going to start talking about other exciting news and breaking it down and providing some inside analysis. So hopefully this is fun for you guys. And thank you again for joining us, Emil. Good to be here. It was a lot of fun again. New subject next time, hopefully. Definitely. Yeah, we'll definitely, <laughs> we'll definitely cover other stuff. All right, folks. So if you have been listening to the Startup Podcast for more than a couple of episodes and getting value out of it, you have implicitly signed up to the Startup Podcast Pact. What that means is we'd like you to rate us and follow us on your favorite listening app and also give us a shout out on your favorite social network. Thanks so much for helping more people find the Startup Podcast. Yanev, this has been fun as always. Absolutely. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye. This episode of the Startup Podcast was brought to you by Insil. Most paid marketing campaigns have a negative ROI. Don't let that be you. Insil brings big brand expertise to small businesses across Australia and pride themselves on their no BS approach to driving traffic, leads, and sales for your business. They're award-winning, but more impressive in my view is the 4.8 star rating that they've earned on Google. Read the reviews, then jump onto insil.com.au and ask them how they can help you. Tell them we sent you. This episode of the Startup Podcast was brought to you by the team at Until Now. Until Now's experts work alongside you and your team, which means that they level you up as they go. I've worked with these folks at Airtasker, and they're behind the recent fantastic rebrand of this very podcast. They are the real deal. Check out their work and get in touch at untilnow.com.au. That's untilnow.com.au.